So I wonder if you've ever heard of the idea to combat racism and prejudice by being colorblind. It's the idea of looking past skin color, looking at the deeper parts of life. And of course, it comes with completely great intentions, right? Look, at, look past the superficial, look at the hard, look at the deeper parts of life. But I want to humbly submit for this presentation, from my experience, that being colorblind is not helpful to combat racism and prejudice. So let me share a little bit of my story. So for the 41 years that I've been on this planet, I've been asked many times, as I'm sure you have at certain points, where are you from? And so I answer the question, uh, I'm from New Jersey, which is often met with a follow-up question, no, no, where are you really from? And I am tempted to answer, well, I'm really from New Jersey. You know, there's people that actually live in New Jersey. Um, but I, of course, then uh, share, about, I understand what they're, they're asking, um, and though I'm you know, a little bit annoyed, but I, I understand what they're, they're asking. They're asking about my Asian complexion. Where is my Asian complexion from? And even though I'm, I'm actually third generation American, so my grandparents on both sides of my family were American citizens, my parents are American citizens, and I'm, of course, American citizen. So I'm as American as you can get, but they're asking about Asian complexion. You know, where does my Asian complexion come from? And, and, and so I, I often politely just answer and share a little bit about my Hong Kong heritage. But the reason why I'm sharing this, on this uh, in this setting is because being colorblind is not the answer. Right? I do have an Asian complexion, and my Asian complexion actually informs a lot of my story, including my spiritual story and my spiritual formation. And so I want to suggest, and I want to humbly challenge us, not to be colorblind, but to go beyond colorblind. And going beyond colorblind means that we're not gonna ignore race and ethnicity. We're actually gonna be extremely aware of race and ethnicity and begin to celebrate the beauty of our ethnic identities while also seeking healing for some ethnic wounds. And in this, the reason why we would do this is because as we explore our ethnic identities, this is very closely tied to our spiritual journeys, to our spiritual formation. Let me read you a quote from a book that's called Beyond Colorblind by an author named Sarah Shin. This is what she says. God breathes his Holy Spirit into our ethnic stories for the sake of mission. We must open ourselves up to his words of kindness, to his greeting and affirmation of who we are in our ethnicities. In the vineyard, we're all about mission, right? The mission of God, building the kingdom of God. A lot of us that are watching this is about uh, church planting. And so as, as we open up our ethnic stories to God, he breathes his Holy Spirit on that portion of our lives, and it brings wind to the mission that we're on, building the kingdom of God, church planting, and evangelism. Now, I want to pause here to kind of address the Caucasians that might be watching this, because I have found out, so I've been exploring this piece of ethnic identity, that a lot of times uh, Caucasians in particular are not as aware or even interested in exploring this piece of ethnic heritage and ethnic identity. And I want to especially encourage you to lean in, because I just finished leading a small group where there were, where there were two Caucasians in this group, the rest were, most, uh, were Asian American, um, but these two Caucasians started out the group not really aware of ethnic identity and ethnic heritage, but as they began to explore this piece in their lives, it was really amazing what began to happen for them in terms of awareness and connection into their spiritual formation. One woman, uh, Caucasian woman who went through this group, she remarked that this was the best small group she ever attended. And that was a big statement because she's in her 50s, been to small groups most of her adult life. But she began to make this connection between ethnic identity, spiritual formation. She began to hear the story of other, the other Asian Americans in, in the group and began to understand their ethnic journey and how that fit into their spiritual formation. It began to explain how, why and how they did certain things in, in terms of spirituality and Christian journey. And so I just want to, my point in sharing that is that exploring ethnic identity and connected in with spiritual formation is important for everyone. And so especially if you might feel that this might not be for you, I, I would encourage you to, to lean in even more. 
Now, um, I, of course, I'll share my journey a little bit, but no one sets a better example for us in this than Jesus. Right? Jesus set the ultimate example of one who navigated the tension between ethnicity and spirituality. He's the only one that has a perfect redeemed ethnic uh, identity. And so it, when, when Jesus was around, ethnic tensions were sky high. Right? The one example would have been the Jews and the Samaritans leading up to the time of Jesus, 600 years of hostility between these two groups. Uh, Jews scorn the Samaritans. But Jesus modeled for us one who had a redeemed ethnic identity, and he leveraged that redeemed ethnic identity in order to reach out to the Samaritan women. Famous story, John chapter 4, about Jesus reaching out to the Samaritan women, which led to the mission of God being expanded. As we begin to seek healing for our ethnic identity, for our ethnic heritage, and we begin to reach out and to extend healing, this brings extension to the mission of God, to the kingdom of God. So, of course, Jesus is the perfect example, but let me dive into my story a little bit, and I'll share my journey as an example of one that's in the process. And I've been on this journey of exploring ethnic identity and connecting in with spiritual formation for the last few years. And so I wanted to provide kind of a human mo model of one that's on the journey, on the progression. So let me start off by sharing a little bit about my ethnic identity um, and a little bit about my paternal grandfather. So my paternal grandfather was an immigrant from China. And he, in the 1940s, was in the laundromat business in New York City not speaking much English at all. And what ended up happening, he was drafted to serve in World War II in the army, not speaking barely any English. And so it was an especially difficult assignment for him. And I have a picture of my grandfather wearing the U this US Army uniform, and that picture has become deeply meaningful to me because it represents to me the immense hardship and sacrifice my ancestors had to pay in order for me to be an American citizen. Uh, and, you know, as, as proud as I am of that ethnic heritage, it's also um, put a lot of pressure on me and my generation and my family, um, unspoken pressure, some spoken pressures to make it, uh, to climb the ladder, uh, to make it worth it what my ancestors had to go through in order for us to be American-born uh, citizens. And so this has led to some performance orientation, you know, working really hard, studying really hard, and, and um, over the years having to work through that. And, and um, I think I'm continuing to work through that piece. And another piece of my ethnic journey that I think will be helpful to share in this setting is that I grew up in an Asian ethnic church in New Jersey. And first, I want to honor that heritage because that Asian ethnic church really helped to lay the spiritual foundation in my life. But I also wanted to honestly share that as an American-born Chinese who speaks very little English, it was very difficult to fit in to the Asian ethnic church. And the Asian ethnic chur churches in, in general tend to heavily emphasize the Asian language and the Asian culture in church life. And sometimes that can be disillusioning to the second generation. Right, because it's like right inside, inside of the church doors is uh, a certain culture that's very Asian, Asian language. Uh, one example would be just uh, how Asian culture is very hierarchical, um, emphasizes respect of elders. And as beautiful as that is, but for a second generation uh, um, uh, uh, Asian American, sometimes life inside the church is so different from right outside the door in mainstream America and having to kind of navigate that tension of, of life in mainstream America than life inside of the church. And it can be sometimes confusing, sometimes disillusioning. And so I, I share this uh, because as, as this has been the story of a lot of Asian Americans, it, it sometimes it leads to the, the next generation really distancing some, themselves from the church and, and even the faith. Actually, the numbers are actually very um, sad that, that up to 90% of young people in Asian ethnic churches they have found leave the church, leave the Asian ethnic church, or even the church altogether after high school because they found that that church life just was, uh, was, was something that was, was confusing and disillusioning. And so that was my story. When I, when I went to college, I made the conscious decision to leave the Asian ethnic church. 
So when I went to college, um, yeah, and it was 1998, I was in college um, at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. There was a Vineyard Christian Fellowship that was starting up. And so I joined the Vineyard in 1998 over at Cornell, and it was a wonderful experience for me. One reason that it was wonderful was that it was not Asian, honestly. And so I left the Asian, the Asian ethnic church, and probably there were some ethnic uh, wounds that needed to be healed uh, at that time. But a wonderful experience joining the Vineyard. And it was very ironic, because shortly after joining the Vineyard in 1998, I felt that the Lord was speaking to me, and he was calling me to be a pioneer of Asian American ministry in the Vineyard. And just to be honest, I wasn't sure that I was, I was really excited about the call at the time. So I felt like the Lord was uh, speaking that to me. And then fast forward to the 1999 National Conference over in Anaheim, California. And so I was a college student. So I went out literally on vacation to the Anaheim Vineyard, the National Conference with my pastors of the Ithaca Vineyard Church Plant. And um, so there's 4,000 people in the room or, or approximately um, thousands of people. And I sensed that the Holy Spirit was telling me to go, to talk, go talk to the guy across the auditorium. I mean, crazy. It was, it was, it was weird. It was... Um, um, but it just, it kept coming. And so a few more promptings, I, I ended up approaching him, and uh, he turned out to be the assistant pastor of a guy named Kenneth Kwan. And he introduced me to Kenneth Kwan. And I, I, as I got talking with Kenneth Kwan, it turned out that he also had sensed the same calling to be a pioneer of Asian, Asian American ministry in the vineyard. So you know, we got to talking, and then um, you know, he, he, he asked me to, to come out to to Los Angeles where his church was after I graduated college. And you know, we kind of had a plan of, of me being there for two years, doing an internship, going to Fuller Seminary. And, uh, but as it turned out, I ended up marrying his daughter. And um, so the, those two years turned out to be 20 years that we've been working together. And I, I'll skip a lot of details here, but I just wanna share that. I believe that God brought me and Kenneth Kwan together um, to help pioneer Asian American ministry in the vineyard. So um, after I joined, Kenneth Kwan's church was a predominantly Asian vineyard. Uh, so I was back in the Asian ethnic church, and the Lord began to work in me um, of, uh, of embracing some of the beauty of my ethnic identity and also getting healed of some ethnic wounds. And in the time that I have left, I just want to share one example of each, one example of how God led me to begin to embrace the beauty of my ethnic identity, and then one example of how the Lord began to heal an ethnic wound. So first, an example of embracing uh, the beauty of my ethnic identity. So I mentioned that I grew up in New Jersey, and it, so there's some pockets of Asian population in New Jersey, but where I grew up, uh, there were, where I went to school, was not that many Asians. In a, in a graduating class of uh, 400, about 400 in high school, I think there was about maybe seven Asians in the class. And so I, I, I experienced all sorts of racism and prejudice um, growing up in school. And I share that to say that there were portions of time, seasons of time even um, in my childhood where I didn't want to be Asian. You know, it did not seem helpful to have an Asian complexion. It didn't seem helpful to make friends. It didn't seem helpful to have an Asian complexion in order to get ahead in school and life. And, um, and so, so there was a piece that I was not really embracing the beauty of my Asian ethnic identity. So fast forward to as I grew older, came to, this, came to the Asian vineyard with Kenneth Kwan, and I started getting involved in cross-cultural ministry a lot more and, and traveling to different, different um, nations, different cultures. And I found that as I engaged certain cultures, Hispanic cultures, Native American cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, I began to realize that my Asian complexion helped me to have a kindred spirit with the others who I was reaching out to. And what, where walls would be up if there would be, let's say, a Caucasian trying to reach out to that group, I found that those walls just quickly drop for me. And I began to see that my Asian complexion was actually a tool. It, it actually, my Asian complexion, complexion actually helped me to have impact in people's lives. I began to see that my Asian complexion had a, had a beauty of God's creation in order to help me to engage the world, to engage the mission of God. One of the most exciting initiatives we have in our church right now is the ministry that we have in the Middle East. And I won't mention the people group just for security reasons, but we send about six to eight teams per year 
uh, to this people group in the Middle East. And it's really been amazing how they've opened up their hearts, opened up their lives, opened up their homes, given us opportunities to share the gospel with them. And it's in large part because of our Asian complexion, where there's other people that go in, you know, um, like, for example, Caucasian, uh, they, they, they've been, the walls have been up, but, but for the, for the God's beauty of our Asian complexion enabled us to help um, um, connect with them and to have kingdom impact in their lives. So I, I offer this as an example of embracing ethnic beauty um, simultaneous to embracing our ethnic identity, our ethnic beauty. We also need to seek healing uh, for some ethnic wounds. And so I want to share an example that happened uh, or started happening at the 2017 National Conference. So at the 2017 National Conference, we host an Asian American ministry workshop to share vision about Asian American ministry. And there was a person at this workshop named Ruben Quintero. And uh, he, Ruben helps oversee the Lavinias in, in, in the US. And so at the time of the 2017 National Conference, me and Ruben were acquaintances. I mean, we knew each other, we liked each other, but I wouldn't say that we were close at that point. And so Ruben had come to our workshop and he brought some of the Hispanic members from his church. And so as he was at his workshop, as we closed out the workshop, it was a time for question and answer. And so Ruben stood up and he had a question and his question was, Dennis, uh, me and my group, referring to him and his Hispanic members from his church, we like to eat Asian food. Dennis, my question for you is, do you and your group like to eat Mexican food? And everyone laughed at the, at the workshop and I, I kind of gave some superficial answer, but uh, I couldn't sleep for like the next week because I was thinking about his question because his question was much deeper than about food. Because the reality is that there is some tension between the Asian community and the Hispanic community. And as Ruben was eloquently, graciously, and humorously pointing out, some of that tension, or that tension, I would say, comes more from the direction of the Asian towards Hispanic. And so as I began to process this, it really prompted me to want to take some initiative, to, to take some concrete action, to seek healing and reconciliation. And so I, I ended up re inviting Ruben out to, and his family and some church members from his church to come out to Walnut, California, where our church is in Los Angeles, and just spend the weekend with us. We treated them out to this great Chinese banquet. Then we had Ruben uh, minister to us on, on Sunday morning. And, um, and then uh, a little while later, Ruben invited me and my family and, and some of our church members out to El Centro, where he lives where his church is, very close to the Mexican border. And uh, he treated us to the best Mexican food that you could possibly have. I, I, I had pozoles for the first time. And um, um, by the way, after eating with Ruben that time, I, I, I discovered and I'm convinced that there will be Mexican food in heaven. Uh, prior to that, I knew that there would be Chinese food, but after uh, eating with Ruben, I know that there's gonna be Mexican food in heaven. And uh, those two weekends uh, with Ruben were really healing in my heart because I always knew that there was a gap. There's some tension between Asians and Hispanics. But this was the first time that I actually took initiative to do something at the church level, to seek healing, to seek reconciliation at a church level. And so I felt like walls broke down in my heart those two weekends. I felt like walls came down in, in the kingdom. I, I pictured Jesus as, as this predominantly Asian church linking arms with a predominantly Hispanic church. I just saw Jesus just smiling from heaven just the, and seeing, and this being just his kingdom and his kids getting together. And uh, Ruben has become like a brother to me over the last few years. I mean, I, we're still uh, working on some projects together with our two churches, and I just see uh, God's kingdom in, in, in all of this. And here's my drive home point in sharing that piece. When ethnic healing comes to the heart, the mission of God gets expanded. And so God calls us to seek ethnic healing in order that the kingdom of God continues to grow. Let me close with one silly story and then I'll, I'm done. Um, but I share this silly story because I think it, it carries with it deep truth, just about um, encouraging us to explore ethnic roots more. So um, I'm sure that uh, many of you listening to this or maybe all of you are familiar with Chick-fil-A. 
And so um, my kids like to go to Chick-fil-A, so I'm there every, every so often. And, and uh, you're probably familiar that when you go to Chick-fil-A, you, when you go up to the counter, they ask you what kind of sauce you want. I always get the same thing, the, the Chick-fil-A original sauce. I always got that. So um, I, a couple of years ago, ended up taking a DNA test. And I found out that I am indeed 89% Chinese, East Asian. But I also surprisingly found out that I'm 11% Polynesian. And so after I found that out, go to Chick-fil-A the next time, go up to the counter, and I realized that there is Polynesian sauce. So of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm Polynesian, I, I, I should get the Polynesian sauce. So I get the Polynesian sauce, I sit down with my wife and my kids, open up the Polynesian sauce, my wife tries some, and she, and she remarks, this is gross. You know, I, I started eating the Polynesian sauce, and I said, this is great, this is the best thing I ever had. And, and I kid you not, I get Polynesian sauce every single time now. And I just find that I just love everything Polynesian. I share with you this story in closing because just a little bit of ethnic identity exploration begins to change the way you engage life. And it will change the way you start engaging even your spirit, Christian spiritual journey. So let me close with uh, just three prompts that I think could be helpful as you navigate this piece. So very quickly, these are the three prompts. One, what is something beautiful about your ethnic identity that you can leverage for the mission of God? Number two, what is something that you might have once upon a time found as a hindrance in your ethnic identity, but you can now find beauty in? My example would be my Asian complexion that I once thought was a hindrance, but now see the beauty and impact that it brings, especially in cross-cultural situations. And number three, are there any ethnic wounds that you have or might have caused that you can take some proactive steps to seek healing for? And my example would be the tension between Asians and Hispanics that I took some concrete steps to bridge.